Hi, everyone. Thanks for joining us today for another episode of Flourish FM. We're delighted to bring you our conversation with Dr. Tom Chatfield, my friend. He's a philosopher of technology, an educator, and an author. He's published a number of books which have been translated into over 30 languages. The most recent book of his is How to Think. Uh, it's on critical thinking, which is one of his key areas of interest. And he's really interested in helping apply his research in critical thinking, particularly to our engagement in technology, but also our lives more widely. It's a great conversation. You're going to love it. Nick, what did you most love about this conversation today? Yeah, I mean, you you hit the two big themes. You know, our, our chat with Tom really was focused on critical thinking, different types of biases, and how these impact our ability to flourish. Um, also technology, our relationship with technology, the way we interact with it and how that might impact our ability to flourish. Uh, I think Tom laid out a bunch of really uh, thoughtful, insightful, big picture ideas and questions, but also broke this down into a lot of tangible action steps. So um, nice rangy conversation and I think something for everybody. Awesome. Thanks, man. All right, everyone, enjoy this episode with Dr. Tom Chatfield. Hey, Tom. How are you? I'm I'm very good, thank you. Oh my goodness, my, my books are, are on display behind you, John. That's <laughs> above and beyond the call of duty. I, uh, I <laughs> thank you so much for having me on. We're excited to have this conversation. Uh, we're we're so glad that you could accept. I've enjoyed getting into uh, a, a couple of the books, the, the ones on display there on John's bookshelf, <laughs> uh, and listening to some of your visits on other podcasts. So this this will be fun. Highly relevant, and important topics. Yeah, well, I'm really really delighted. I I love. Um, I love audio as a format. See, you know already, you're a real pro. You have, I got to <laughs> say, you have a great voice for for an audio format as well. I, I kind of feel I, I'm much better with the voice than with the face. Like I, it's one of the reasons I, I, I love radio and I, I, I do a little bit of film and television, but not a lot, you know, and, and some people are so natural with that. And I, the more into it I get with my voice, the more my face does all kinds of things. But in <laughs> retrospect, I kind of wish it didn't do. <laughs> so... Um, yeah, I apologise for the face, but hopefully the voice will hopefully the voice will be compensating for that. Face looks great, voice sounds great. <laughs> yeah, yeah. No, I I feel it. Any anytime somebody tells me I have a voice for radio, usually I follow up and say I think I got a face for it too. So I, I feel you there. I'm really excited to dig into a couple really important content areas with you: critical thinking as it relates to flourishing, and our tech use as it relates to flourishing. How to thrive in the digital age. But before we dive into the content, we just want to get to know you a little bit. Tell us a little bit about your background and sort of how you arrived at these two really important and influential topics and, and the primary focus of your work. So um, thank you for having me. I, I guess I think about myself as, as someone with no particular expertise, but a lot of interests. Um, from when I was very young, I, I wanted to be a writer. I kind of wrote indiscriminately sort of poetry and sci-fi and computer programs and all kinds of things. Um, and I, I went to, and did my, my undergrad and my master's and my doctorate at Oxford in literature and then kind of literature and philosophy. But I was a restless geek. This was in the kind of late 90s and early 2000s. And um, I was really obsessed with technology. I played a lot of video games in my spare time. And it became, I suppose, very clear to me that all the stuff I cared about, the realm of ideas and, and literature and beauty and art and value um, was being mediated through various technologies, that, that technology was bound up with, with everything. Um, and that wasn't being covered at that particular time in, in the kind of academic areas I was in. And so I sort of ran away from academia and went to do writing and editing and stuff in London. And ended up writing a book about video games because I'd, I'd worked on a couple of games with friends. I thought they were fascinating as a medium. Um, and that book led me to effectively quit writing and editing and try and make my own way as a, as a thinker and writer and speaker. And I more or less followed my obsessions. And my obsessions were increasingly focused around these two themes, I guess. What does it mean to think well? What does it mean to more clearly grasp what's going on around you and to help others do the same, to be involved in a kind of good, constructive, rich conversation? And linked to this, what in the particular 21st century context, and if you like the, the digital technological context, what does it mean to use technology well and not to be used by it? So if you like to go beyond the sort of idea of there's a user and there are features and the user is a consumer and you use technology and all this is all new and all this has none of this has happened before 
And actually, to completely spin that around and say, well, you know, human nature is being, is being mediated in profound in new ways. But one of the most useful ways we can illuminate this, perhaps, is to talk about some quite old stuff, is to look for continuities, is to look through the history of philosophy, is to talk about which human values we do and sort of don't want to instantiate in our technologies. So this went round and round in my head, and I have produced a lot of books. I've written a book called How to Thrive in the Digital Age. I've written a book about language and technology. I've written my first book about video games. And over the last few years, I've been very lucky to work very closely with the academic publisher, Sage, for whom I've produced a number of books about critical thinking, uh, which are really meant to be useful they're meant to be accessible guides to students studying now, wrestling with information overload, trying to deal with huge amounts of on-screen stimulation and opportunity and, and get to grips with the world and its wicked and complicated problems. So I've come to end up in this place, I guess, where I write and think and speak around using technology well, thinking well, but increasingly in this holistic context of when you have this life that is surrounded by screens and devices and all kinds of pressures and manipulations and um, you know, kind of behavioral engineering built into the systems you use, what on earth do you do? What is it useful to do to try and clarify your own thoughts, to try and focus on what we might call thriving, this, this lovely Aristotelian idea that I guess we'll get into about having a direction for your life that, that points towards fulfillment of some kind rather than just feeling controlled. So it's a wonderful mess. It's a wonderful maelstrom. Yeah. Thank you, Tom, for that incredibly rich answer to that question. And we very much enjoyed reading your most recent book, Nick and I, uh, How to Think, which is beautifully on display behind me, as you can see here. Um, but let's dive into then your work on critical thinking. So critical thinking skills are increasingly regarded as some of the most important workplace skills and those on which we should be focusing more on education. Research suggests that critical thinking skills lead to better real-world, interpersonal, business, and financial outcomes. A strong majority of employers regard critical thinking as one of the top skills needed in graduates, and they want universities to place stronger emphasis on critical thinking skills. And critical thinking skills is one of the most frequently mentioned set of essential skills for academic and career success. Evidence also suggests that critical thinking skills can have a positive impact on areas related to health and well-being. Moreover, they're arguably more important today than ever before in a time when misinformation and disinformation are rife on the media and on the internet, as you point out in your most recent book. So as a leading expert on critical thinking, who's published a great deal in this area, why do you think these skills are important for human flourishing? And do you think they're more important today than ever before? Right. So the first thing I'd say is critical thinking skills are both hugely important and they're not a kind of magic by which I mean they're important precisely because at their heart, they're about what you might call epistemic humility, or to put it in more everyday terms, about the fact that it's very hard indeed to work out exactly what is going on. And that in general, the first thing we come up with, the first impressions we have and the information that's most readily to hand, it may or may not be useful, but it's almost always inadequate. And what this in turn means is that the skills associated with working alongside others to try and gain a less deceived, better informed and more telling understanding of the world are incredibly valuable. And when you are surrounded by an apparatus of you know, research and information technology that is wonderful in so many ways, but that has very, very deep if you like, structural biases towards recency, emotional impact, and availability, it's all the more valuable to be aware of these vulnerabilities and to have the skills at your disposal for making the most of these incredible opportunities rather than being manipulated by them. So let's pick a very simple example. Confirmation bias is rightly very famous and much discussed because it describes something universal about human beings and human minds which is that in general we are much more willing and able to take on board and seek out information that confirms something we already believe or might like to be true than we are to seek out or take on board information that 
contradicts or problematizes or is outside that. And in some ways, this is just part of being a person with a particular perspective. It's self-evident that if I am an English-speaking dude in my early 40s, that which is available to me online and that which I seek out and that which I know about um, is going to reflect my education, my background. When I type in a search term, it's obviously going to reflect something that I, I know I want to find out and so on. And so there's going to be vast amounts of information out there that I don't even know, I don't know that's unavailable to me. Right. Mm -hmm. And when it comes to certain questions, um, it's going to be very dangerous indeed if I go with a fundamentally confirmatory mode of investigation. If I type into Google, you know, what's going on in Spain, and I see two or three headlines, and I know very little about Spain, I, I have a few cliches and stereotypes in my head, and I see something, and I say, oh, yeah, yeah, that, that fits, doesn't it? Now, obviously, what's going on there is, I don't know, a governmental crisis, or, um, you know, they're always going on about this or that. That's very dangerous, because the confirmation there does nothing other than reinforce some prejudices and generalizations. Mm -hmm. Of course, a much more urgent scenario is if I am worried about vaccines and I type into YouTube or Google, vaccine dangerous. Now, what I'm going to find there is an endless number of results um, towards the top, although search engines are getting better at uh, trying to introduce some facts into this realm, um, <laughs> that re repeat at me various messages that are highly emotionally impactful about the dangers of vaccines. So to get back to critical thinking, the reason I do think that the whole toolkit of skills that fall in, in that under that heading are so important is that all of them are at root about different techniques for overcoming confirmation, for embracing doubt constructively, and then for using sources and other people and materials in a careful, discerning way to gradually try and work out what's actually going on in the field and how far you can and can't trust various different claims or test them, rather than just thinking uncritically and taking at face value whatever happens to be immediately available to you or most congenial to you or being said by people who look like you or that exists on a sort of pre-conscious level of, of prejudice in you. So it is hugely important today. And, and the last thing I'd say, I guess, in if you like pragmatic terms, is that it's also one of the skills that I think humans can most valuably bring into human-machine collaborations and information environments. So one way of thinking about this is that machine learning systems and artificial intelligence and technology is getting better and better at giving us answers. And it's superbly good in certain circumstances at providing answers. It doesn't yet come up with questions. You have to have people to frame an issue in a certain way, to prioritize certain things, to ask a question. And so the ability to ask good questions is becoming more and more valuable the more information and systems and automation is out there. Tom, that's a, a wonderfully, I think, thoughtful and, and rich response to our initial question here. And it, I think it brings up the fundamental issue of what is true and what is untrue, right? And the, the sort of next sequential thought that I have is how do we go about this? So you say, ask good questions, right? And we can keep playing with an idea like confirmation bias, because I think, you know, most people have a general sense of what that means, even simply by the title, right? And we eventually want to get into affect bias as well and the role that that plays, how would you suggest, you know, some of our listeners go about asking better questions? You, you use the example of, you know, you Google vaccine dangerous and you get a wealth of information. Um, some of it good, some of it not so good. Um, some of it will suggest something about vaccine. Some of it will suggest another. It seems to me we want some of those different ends of the spectrum because that's what critical thinking is, right? Knowing what you don't know, doing the work to investigate and then trying to elicit something resembling some semblance of truth. How do we go about that process? In terms of questions, I guess one of the simplest things we can do is first of all, pause. I really want to emphasize that it sounds incredibly basic, unbelievably basic, even patronizingly so. But if you don't pause and take the time 
to think twice, none of the other good stuff can happen. On Twitter, you constantly see yeah. very brilliant people saying very foolish things. And also non-brilliant people, but in general. <laughs> a few of those too. <laughs> in general, I think a lot of people have done more harm than good in the world and to their own reputations because of a hasty and highly affective environment where you say something fast. And of course, the social media environment is indifferent to truth, but deeply interested in affect. And so, you know, that's one very good way to get a following is to say stuff that's highly impactful. So I want to just, Tom, just super quickly, we should clarify yeah. for listeners when we when we all use the word affect, we're essentially talking emotion, emotional response. Exactly right. right. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Sorry. Sorry. Yeah. I'm getting I'm getting jargony already. Affect, no problem. We emotional do too. Yep. Easy to do. Highly affective, highly emotional. That's right. So and this pausing is a really difficult self-discipline when a lot of the you know prods and pokes in your life, a lot of the behavioral manipulations and incentives sur surrounding you are geared towards speed, are geared towards speed, emotion, freshness, and so on. So it's super important to realize that in a way, you know, you have a limited stock of time and a limited cognitive capacity and, and, and so on. You've got lots of limits. And if you want to do good stuff that has integrity and get, get to grips with something, you need to take a bit of time. You need to pause. And then really the first question to ask is, well, do I know enough about this to arrive at a good judgment? Uh, among many others, Danny Kahneman, the Nobel-winning behavioral economist, has written about this very lucidly in his famous book, Thinking Fast and Slow and Elsewhere. And he, he makes, I think, the foundational point that a, a snap judgment, a heuristic, a mental rule of thumb, is pretty reliable if you're dealing with something that you have plenty of experience of and that is susceptible to intuition. So, for example, you know, if I say, what do you fancy for lunch? If I say, you know, do you want to go out or do you think you're going to do some better work if you stay at home? Or if you spend a lot of time writing about music or film and you say, well, does this film look interesting? Is it, is it worth having a look at? In all of those situations, in a sense, you have meaningful expertise and you're dealing with the kind of question that is susceptible to expertise and that's that you can learn meaningful things about. The dangerous situation is when you lack expertise or knowledge or the question is not one that is susceptible to the kind of expertise you have. And so, for example, you know, what are oil prices in two years' time going to be like? Um, it's not necessarily a question it's possible to have a very informed long-term view about in quantitative terms. And a really good expert view of that might begin by saying, well, if you look historically, the uncertainty is incredibly profound and exists within this range. So the second, so the second question is we're after, second, you pause, and then you say, well, you know, can I trust my own judgment on this? do I need to go and look for some cognitive reinforcements? And the answer may be yes. If you do need to find cognitive reinforcements, the question is then, well, who or what should I turn to? Who knows about this? What is out there? And um, what can I do to expose myself as far as possible to the things I don't know but need to know? And again, we could say this is a two-part thing. Sorry, I, I'm, I'm no. Gonna that's go great. On. That's please, great. It's, please come in. The, the exposure, I think, is is where we want to try to start digging in a little bit more deeply. And I'd love for you, um, as we move into this next question, to explain to the listeners the term affect bias. Uh, but I want to frame up the question this way: We recently had on a George Mason professor. Todd Cashin and Todd's written a slew of great books, but one of them is called The Upside of Your Dark Side. And we had a really robust conversation with him about distress tolerance, the willingness and the ability to sort of navigate unpleasant emotions. And I think John and I feel like these are intimately tied to what you're talking about. Pausing, yes, but pausing to recognize, okay, what I might be looking at makes me feel bad. It's creating some sort of incongruence, right? Or maybe disconfirming cognitive dissonance, we would call it, what I think to be true. 
and I need to take action. And what you're talking about is, is then taking follow-up steps to sort of, you know, make sense of what it is that we're looking at. Will you talk a little bit about affect bias and sort of how we might navigate this, this potential experience of unpleasantness as we try to drive ourselves towards truth? Yeah, that's a great point. And I think there is this foundational point that actually the business of, of seeking to become more reasonable and, if you like, less deceived is intimately bound up with our emotions, with our comfort, with our discomfort, with our affect, to use this kind of technical term for emotions. It's not at all about trying to sort of flip a switch and become a, a being of pure logic. That's not going to happen. Right. And one of the first things, there's a lovely phrase um, that's used a lot, um, I think, in, in psychological literature in, in, in America, which is this idea of a comfort with discomfort, which is the idea that you can become comfortable in a second order way with the fact that there are certain areas you have deep ambivalences about or anxieties around or, or that provoke this sort of intense emotional reaction. And that, that's a form of information. Now, I think emotional self-mastery and feeling safe and feeling secure and, and helping others to feel that is, is a really important part of this. I don't want to belittle um, the degree to which certain people may have real trauma or difficulty and need to protect themselves from certain things. But that being said, I think being able to observe your own emotions and treat that as a form of information pointing the way towards avenues for research and exploration is incredibly valuable. Um, and also be able to share these things and recognize them. I think there's nothing wrong with, I think the pretense that you don't have these feelings is very dangerous because it can lead you into a place where you're adopting a false position. Once you've observed these things, from a philosophical perspective, I always put a great deal of emphasis upon uh, what's sometimes known as the principle of charity, which is a very old and a very simple idea. And it really states um, that the more you disagree with something or find it strange or perhaps objectionable, um, the more benefit you potentially have in the intellectual sense from engaging with it as charitably as possible. And charity doesn't mean you know, giving money to be nice. Charity means trying to work through it in its most kind of rigorous and reasonable form, not because you agree with it or, or necessarily think it's a good position, ethically speaking, but because if you wish to put your own ideas to the test, explore an area of, of discomfort or uncertainty, you really need to try and make sure that you are encountering the ideas in that area in their kind of strongest and most lucid possible form, precisely so that you can marshal your own thoughts, learn from them, test ideas, and synthesize them and, and move forward. So a simpler verdict here might be to do with the example of, say, anti-vaxxing, which I mentioned earlier. And it's enormously easy on both sides of this to be consumed by passionate emotion. And, and indeed, it's a, a subject of enormous um, you know, social and personal angst and intensity and bound up with, with, with the stuff of life and death. But if you want to try and move through this and engage with it, let's say for the sake of argument that I'm someone who's very in favour of vaccination and I'm trying to engage with people who are very against it, past a certain point, I'm not going to achieve much in terms of clarifying my own views or exploring ideas or getting understanding if I settle for a straw man version of their beliefs. The straw man is a metaphor for a deliberately weak version of someone else's argument or point of view. You burn straw men, that's what you do. So if I want to perform on social media for my follows, followers, so to speak, who I think think like me, I can characterize someone else's idea in the crudest of possible terms and then right. say they are a bad person, they're foolish. And I may get a round of applause and, and some extra followers from that. And I may stir up some ferocious debate and find that I can then go and be paid to go on the radio and, and, and say more passionate things. Um, but if instead of building a straw man, I, I try to build a steel man, a very gendered term, perhaps a steel person, and doing something much more interesting. A steel man is a strong, non-flammable version of someone else's idea. And I might say, well, for example, in this particular case, there are people who, for very good reasons, feel that the government and the health service have lied to them, 
consistently, have treated them as second-class citizens, have said one thing while doing another. Perhaps there are people who've been on the receiving end of hypocrisy for year after year, who've been told, your lives matter, we care about you, you live in a great country, your country loves you, but who actually, in terms of the actions they see in their lives, have received terrible and neglectful health care, have received huge price hikes in essential medications. They can't see their doctors. They can't afford to live. Their health is manifestly worse than that of many others through nothing other than accidents of birth, and so on and so on. These are people who have very good reasons for distrusting officials who say, well, you ought to do this. We're the experts. Sure. It doesn't mean that they are right when it comes down to a scientific analysis of the efficaciousness of a particular vaccine, but it does mean that trying to explore this deeply uncomfortable area is going to be a much richer and more fruitful experience. And it may even lead to meaningful dialogue. Who knows? If you don't just burn straw men in public and instead take the time, the trouble to try and engage with the strongest possible version of their argument. And also to assume as a starting point that someone else has good rather than cynical motivations. Mm -hmm. This is a very important and I think often neglected aspect of this kind of critical engagement. Don't begin by thinking the worst of someone. And you, you may later on want to think the worst of them, but you need to earn that. I, I you hear to... you saying start with grace and start with yeah. humility. Exactly. That yeah, you've just you could have saved me five minutes. <laughs> <laughs> so I think I think this kind of and I really think this this humility runs all the way through. Uh, it's easy to valorize the scientific method in terms of facts and evidence and empiricism. But in many ways, the humility that runs through the best scientific research is, is aligned with this kind of embrace of doubt all the way down. You explain, you explain why you believe something, what the evidence for that is, the limitations of that evidence, the other work that's been done in the area, the questions you still have, and you rinse and repeat and you remain open. And to some degree, what you don't do um, is talk down to people from an expert pinnacle and dismiss them because of ignorance. Now, this may be very, very difficult when you are in totally different positions in terms of knowledge or, or when you believe someone is saying something profoundly dangerous or misguided. You know, this is a huge challenge. But I think in, in a democracy in particular, there is, if you like, a duty of rational persuasion rather than coercion. Now, we can talk about the limits of that, because obviously there's also a need to, to legislate, if you like, coercively around certain harms. But broadly speaking, the failure to persuade someone um, of a particular argument or action or, or course of policy is, is very dangerous, because once you start to replace rational persuasion with coercion, you're, you're going down a path um, where people are not treated as rational agents. And rational, I don't mean cool and logical. Rational, I mean specifically people who deserve to be told the reasons behind things. And people who deserve to be told the reasons behind things precisely because discussing the reasons behind things is good, is a good, is part of living, as it were, an examined life in an open society where a diversity of opinions and values coexist and can coexist peaceably through mechanisms for debating, choosing and deciding, where we're not all just either burning straw men all over the place or legislating coercively. So mm -hmm. these are very live issues. You know, mm -hmm. I'm, not, I'm, not, I'm not the man with the answers. I mean, of course I'm not. Um, but they're very live issues because I think, among other things, it's enormously tempting in a situation that presents itself as extreme or unprecedented to, to leap straight towards a position that's very, as it were, comfortingly concrete. It's very easy to dispense with doubt and to, to stand up as a politician or a scientist or a thinker and say, here we are. The evidence says this. The country needs this. These are the bad people. These are the good people. These are your friends. These are your enemies. This is what we need to do. Follow me. And historically speaking, there are bad precedents for this. I think finding the language of constructive doubt publicly and personally is, is just hugely valuable now. Finding a constructive, collaborative humility 
Mm-hmm. Um, but but one that has a direction, one that is interested in the project of becoming less deceived. Of um, if this, we're not talking about relativism here. We're not talking about everything goes and everyone's view is equally valid. We're talking about begin with humility and charity and then work forward from there together. Mm-hmm. Great. Thank you. Another incredibly rich response to our question, Tom. Um, I like particularly the notion you just described, described there, a constructive collaborative humility as an important virtue to cultivate in order to think well and live well. And you've given various pieces of very clear advice here on how to cultivate and, and utilize critical thinking skills in order to, to live good lives. We want to dive into your, your work on technology in a moment, but before we proceed, is there any further advice you want to kind of provide on how we can best apply key principles of critical thinking to our own lives in order to live the best lives we can? Perhaps summarizing some of the key points you've made or any, any others you, you particularly uh, want to add. Without wanting to be patronizing, I think asking and living with open questions is a very valuable intellectual habit. Now, I, I'm not great about this. By an open question, I mean a question to which the answer is not just kind of a fact or a yes or no. So a closed question is, how tall is Mount Everest? And Google can give me an answer for that brilliantly. But an open question is what should a society aspire towards or what do I want out of life? And being able to differentiate between these questions is vital if you want to differentiate between questions you can deal with, so to speak, quickly and factually and questions that you need to live with and where you actually need to be interrogating the assumptions rather than the answers. So another perhaps clearer way of putting this is that In many circumstances, the question you choose to ask matters much more than the answer you happen to get. And different framings of a question will elicit different answers. And that in turn suggests a very good intellectual habit is to try and reframe any significant issue in several ways. So let's take an issue like fairness. Now, we might be interested in saying, well, what's a fair outcome in this particular case? What's a fair policy? What is a fair way of allocating this resource? What does it mean to make a test fair in school? What does it mean to offer a a fair verdict in the trial? Fair enough. Each of those questions can seem like a a closed question in that it may presuppose that there's an answer out there that's, that's a good answer. But it can be very rich to try and reframe the issue and instead to say, is a fair result one in which everyone does the same? Is a fair result one in which everyone had an equal opportunity to try? Is a fair situation one in which people were started in different places depending upon their levels of advantage or disadvantage or privilege? Or is a fair result one in which the same rules are applied to all? Or is a fair result impossible? Or is a fair result one which respects tradition? Is a fair result the same for everybody in every country, or is a fair result one that reflects local conditions and so on? And so the moment we dig into these kind of assumptions, we realize that the framing of our questions is incredibly important. Now, again, I feel that I end up sounding abstract when I, I am talking about something that I think is very is very practical and important. I think this idea of, of just reframing minor questions is very valuable and saying, well, okay, I'm wondering what it means to study effectively. But I may also want to ask why I'm studying. I may also want to ask what I mean by the word effective. I may also want to ask what I enjoy and why, and what I don't enjoy and why. In other words, I may want to take a few steps back. So that's one thing I'd like to encourage people to do, is to to think about those situations which a question is simple and can be dealt with um, in a simple way. But then when it isn't, to pause and see what different framings around an issue might elicit in terms of questions and frames of reference as well as answers. Excellent. Thank you. Let's let's start to transition a little bit. I mean, you already referenced Twitter, 
right? And so we're we you know we're talking here about how to think, the more specifically how to think critically. Uh, I think you know we all agree that those are pretty closely um, related to how to, to interact with our tools and specifically tech tools, right? So. Let's transition and chatting a little bit about social media. I think there a lot has been talked about, written about when it comes to social media and its impact on our well-being, on our ability to flourish, what we get exposed to, what we don't get exposed to. What are your thoughts on sort of the the place and role of social media in our lives and the impact on our our well-being right now? And, And then we'll start to move into some more specific topics around our tech usage. I guess... Like most people, I'm ambivalent. And one of the reasons I'm ambivalent is that I'm aware there are constant tensions between, if you like, my my wants and needs and technology's wants and needs for me and from me. And one way I frame this is that I think one way of a technology becoming a net positive in your life is for there to be an informed negotiation between you and it. There are no neutral tools all tools have certain values. All tools want certain things for you, not in the sense that they you know, have little brains and want you to go to the shops, but in the sense that they make certain kinds of behavior easier and reward those behaviors. And certain kinds of behavior or interaction uh, more difficult or less likely or impossible or unacknowledged. And so on social media, very obviously, one of the central ways that money is made from it is by encouraging people to interact as frequently as possible, right. as reveningly as possible in terms of certain kinds of emotional preference. Um, and it rewards, um, you know, highly emotionally engaging stuff. A lot of other things are going on as well, but it's a good, I think, place to start by thinking, well, if this is a technology that wants me to respond fast and emotively and to seek various kinds of reassurance and endorsement and never to stop using it, you know, to use it bottomlessly, to scroll endlessly, to lose track of time, then if I'm going to make it work for me, I need to be clear about what I want out of this technology, what my wants are, and what an informed negotiation between these things might look like. And so it might be in the case of social media, depending on what you want from it, that that you only use it at certain times of day, rather than being online all the time that you try to always pause before sending a message so that you can review it and and re-encounter it as a a reader. It might be that you use block and mute a great deal to shut down stuff that you find upsetting or counterproductive or or difficult. Um, And it might be that you decide that you are going to largely interact only with people um, you respect or actively want to seek out their views that you're going to use it and so on and so on. So there's this idea of a negotiation, I guess I could talk personally, uh, which is that I broadly speaking, try to use social media in, in a limited way. I try to restrict the time I spend, spend on it um, because it can be a time sink that takes me away from more considered modes of thought that, that are important to me, like reading books and writing books I'm not on Facebook. I've I kind of removed myself from that. I'm, I really only use one social media service, Twitter, um, because I feel that's all I have space for in my life. And I, I try, broadly speaking, not anymore to send kind of short emotive messages about the message of the day. Very hard to resist this with the current state of politics in the UK, but I don't necessarily feel that my voice adds anything much positive to any of that. I don't feel that that my kind of white male middle-aged perspective is is what the world is most urgently pining for. I I don't feel it can do me or the world much good really to sort of speak out about the thing that I have to say stuff about. More generally, I guess, the the writer Cory Doctorow um, spoke some while ago um, about the idea of being a digital gourmet which I find a lovely sort of shorthand, because if you are a gourmet, if you love food, you don't just stuff your face with food all the time. To love something is not to constantly wallow in it and overconsume it. It is to have a discerning and critically engaged relationship with it. It is to say no as well as yes. And it is to kind of review this relationship in, in the light of knowledge. Overall, I feel people would do well to try and have a gourmet relationship with technologies. And to try where they have, you know, agency and choices. 
to to ask constantly, well, what do I want to say no to? And what do I want to say yes to? And why? What am I trying to get out of this? What, if I love this technology, if it can do good things for me, what are they? And to not be afraid of refusals. The last thing I'd say, I guess, is that so much of this is to do with habit and, if you like, attentional bandwidth and, and so on. You know, one of the great advantages and dangers of technology is the degree to which it can automate and make habitual and easy um, all kinds of things. And what that means from a practical point of view is it's a really good idea regularly to audit your, your habits, <laughs> regularly to audit your habits, the apps on your phone, what you're doing with your time and attention. You will adopt something and then it will become habitual. Your thumbs will you know, find their way towards WhatsApp or Twitter. You will have it open in the background and you will be to some degree habitually dancing along to the particular nudges of that system. So every now and then push back on this, remove apps from your phone, cut stuff down, reserve the right to change your mind or withdraw. And all of this, of course, is advice of people who, I guess, want to have this kind of considered relationship I'm discussing. There's plenty of people who just want to have as many followers as possible, right. who, who want to sell stuff, who want to monetize things, who want to advertise. In those cases, I think it's much more the case that you need to at least go knowingly into these bargains and, and realize what's being taken as well as what's being given mm -hmm. um, and, and not think um, that this is something you, you have to do and can't back out of to try and whoever you are and whatever you're doing, understand what your choices are, that a negotiation is possible, and then set about conducting that negotiation as discerningly as you in particular can. Mm -hmm. I love this idea of negotiation. I think you hit the nail on the head and it brings up a couple, I think, important quotes from some of the things that you've written. You mentioned, um, you know, getting what we want online is often different than getting what we need. And I'd love to tug on that thread a little bit more because I think it ties back to what we, we chatted about earlier, which is what you want might be to feel a particular way. It might be to feel good. Is that what you need in that particular moment when you're focusing on a topic, right? Conversely, you might be struggling with a certain number of things and you, you do genuinely need to feel better. You need to expose yourself to some content, to some media that sort of, you know, lightens your load and, you know, videos of puppies and kittens and those sorts of things. And But I love the idea you've laid out here, which is know what it is you're going after and then be intentional about that so that you don't, as you put it again, turn the potential miracles of technologies into snares, which I think is such a beautiful sentiment, right? So I just, I want to, I want to kind of double click on that again. Would you maybe just um, tease out a little bit more what you mean by what we want versus what we need? And then I want to throw it over to John to, to transition us into talking about attention, because you just hit that nail on the head and, and we want to kind of tug on that thread as well. Yeah. So there's this great psychological term miswanting which is the idea that you can you know want things that are that, that are that are bad for you or counterproductive and also you can not want to want the things you want i want approval on social media but i wish i didn't want approval on social media um and we were talking earlier about emotions and about having if you like a comfort with discomfort and i think once again owning this stuff is one of the keys to dealing with it critically by which I mean be able to think about your wants and realize that you can have a thoughtful relationship with your own desires and vulnerabilities. Above all, a point I always come back to is that the negotiation, the strategy, the control and agency you have, they are not solely or even primarily matters of the intellect and the will. They are much more holistic than that. And if you are going to move towards you know better and richer habits be in a good direction take control in various senses of that word you, you need to think holistically about your routines your your body your your emotions you need to get all the support you can so let me be concrete about this it's not going to work to sort of sit there and exercise your magnificent willpower if you're at a desk with your phone in your hand with your notifications on push eight hours a day, you're going to burn through that willpower yeah. and you're going yeah. to feel bad about it. Yeah. You need to think, I need to think, we need to think as embodied human beings about the, the contexts, the environments, the habits, the practices that help us 
you know, be a little bit better in whatever ways we take the word better to mean. And maybe that means leaving your phone behind when you go out for a walk. Maybe that means switching notifications to pull so that they only come when you want them to rather than push. Maybe it means not having windows open in the background. Maybe it means tidying your office. Maybe it means doing some work in a coffee shop. Maybe it means getting more sleep. Maybe it means doing some exercise. These things are all connected. There's not, the pandemic has appallingly taught us this. There's not your kind of work self and your home self and they are totally separate. So I really think taking this holistic view of, of what it means gradually to interrogate and improve and, and make things work better is incredibly valuable. I often ask a question of people when I'm doing workshops and things, what are your best habits? And what I mean by that is what are those things that you habitually do that help you in a small or a big way to be, if you like, your better self, to align your wants better with your needs? And people say things like, I go for a run. I make a nice cup of coffee in the morning. I say something, I, I pay a compliment to a friend. I help a stranger. They don't usually say, my best habit is the fact that I spend half an hour on social media frantically clicking the like button. Um, because in general, that's the kind of thing people don't want to want. They want to let go of their attachment. A lot of mindfulness and, and Buddhist and spiritual work is, is done around our, our wants and our attachments. And I think there's a, a great degree of value in the acceptance and observations of these things and the realisation that, that changing them, is, as I say, is not primarily a matter of the will. It's a matter of the, the practices and habits. So I mean yeah. my mm -hmm. office in the garden, the huge privilege to have a space where my children are not running around screaming and throwing soft toys at me. Mm -hmm. If you don't have a workplace like this, it can be hugely stressful to find, um, so to speak, your your clearer, calmer working self. You may be, you know, sharing or sharing a small room with other people or caring for someone. You may be in great distress. You may have a lot of stuff going on in your life. But there's still this question as to what it means then to try to negotiate an accommodation with that. What mm -hmm. what helps you? How do these things add up? Yeah. I think when we're talking about technology and thinking, we can very often just focus obsessively with the device. And that falls into the very trap that we're trying to get out of, which is to think that the device is the world, that that which is on the screen is the totality of the options you have for improving your relationships with and through technology. To be honest, it's the opposite. I don't think you should go on a digital detox because I don't think technology is toxic. I don't, I don't think that's a helpful way of thinking about it. I think you should enter into a negotiation with the place of technology in your life and your thinking and your wanting by realizing that your life is your body, your diet, your friends, your exercise, the places where you work, the places where you go, and that what you're doing with your phone and technology in that context um, is going to have profound effects on how well and richly you're able to change things over time, improve things, adjust things, and so on. Mm -hmm. So, yeah, be be holistic embrace <laughs> embrace the larger yeah. context environmental yeah. and and somatic cues right that's what that's yeah. what ultimately triggers a habit anyway right absolutely yeah, well absolutely and i think it's, it's you know in a way it's it's humility plus knowledge isn't it it's realizing it's the answer is almost never willpower mm -hmm. the answer is almost never the purely intellectual disembodied thing and actually that's one of the great delusions of the screen in some ways you know we are metaphorically dismembered by our tools into eyeballs and fingers. But that is a terribly impoverished description of thought and interaction. And I think not to fall for that. Um, yeah. And, you know, the classic observation, remember there's other people behind the screen. They may be terrible people. Um, they, they may be people you, you disapprove of deeply, but they're still people. And the terrible things they're doing are being done for people reasons. And those people reasons are messy and complicated and intractable and rooted in a particular place, just like you. Yeah. A couple of um, particular things to, to take home from that um, that certainly resonated with me that uh, I think it's worth you know, drawing our listeners' attention to. You know, to refer back to your earlier point about create you know, constructive collaborative humility. There's this thing you think we need to cultivate in ourselves and how you just talked about there, how, um, you know, human beings aren't just isolated individuals. And it's not just our individual 
you know, willpower that's that's giving us problems here, potential problems with the ways in which we interact with technology and and social media and so on. But it's more of a collective enterprise that's both a problem here, but also the solution to or the way out of certain issues we find. Um, some, you know, a reference also maybe worth to mention this, to listeners here is that uh, Keith Sawyer in his book on group flow or group thinking, as it were, he argues that, you know, all innovation really emerges out of collaboration and perhaps your um, constructive collaborative humility is perhaps something to to connect with that the way in which we can thrive as human beings is in a more collaborative way something else that really resonated that you said there is the notion of unwanting in psychology um it's perhaps useful also to mention there's some interesting research by kent berridge a psychologist and neuroscientist on the distinction between liking something and wanting something that we often think we like something but we actually just want it and we don't like it but that makes us think that we that we like it and he's done some interesting work there on addiction i'm just mentioning those as other things for our listeners we're gonna we're gonna have some show notes on this where we flag some of the various references you pointed out and some of these too it's good to tease these out um but we want to deep dive more into into technology here and to focus also on something you mentioned really about attention attention is often said to be the kind of most valuable thing in life and shortly after that is, is time and um you've written on the ways in which technology is blurring the lines between work and leisure. Now, this is problematic for our well-being in that we um, arguably never switch off or really switch off from work and engage in social activities with one another, you know, with less and less attention because our attention is elsewhere. It's focused on work and the stresses of the days and we're not really in the moment doing the kind of engaged in social activities to the extent that we perhaps should be or would want to be. And that can increase, and evidence suggests that, that tends to increase stress and reduces our, our happiness. Do you think technology is mostly to blame for this? And what can we do to blur the lines less between work and leisure in our digital lives in this digital age and have more attention in our social spaces? So a great deal is, is rightly written about attention. And I've it's a theme I've returned to um, over the last decade. And I'm quite conflicted about some of this because... I think on the one hand, the observation that attention is this scarce resource which is being madly competed for by, you know, dazzlingly manipulative algorithms. There's quite a lot of merit in that. You know, the classic observation that if you're using a free service, you are the product and that, you know, gambling-like mechanics are used to, to keep people scrolling, much as casinos have kind of windowless environments where there's no day and there's no night. And there's the constant flow experience in yeah. Chickasaw, the highest sense of the word flow, um, of feedback and so on and so on. So I think there's absolutely addiction by design, to quote a phrase from Natasha Doe-Schul's great book, um, in many of the systems we use and that we should be very suspicious of that. At the same time, I think that the very framing of attention as a kind of budget that you spend in some ways overlooks the most important counterpoints to this um, kind of monetized and um, measured version of attention. And that's the fact that how we attend to something is enormously important. Whether we attend fully, whether we attend completely, whether we attend emotionally, that attention is not just a fungible matter of minutes and seconds. Right. It's much more profound than that how we attend to someone or something, the way we turn our minds towards it, is an ethical question, is a question of what we believe that thing to be, what claim upon us we believe it to have, especially if that thing is a person. Do we attend openly and empathetically? Or do we attend with scepticism? Or do we attend with hostility? Do we attend in a spirit of excitement? Or do we attend in a harried and distracted way? Now, we don't always fully control this. But I think the observation that connects these things is that if all our time is taken up with one kind of thing, by definition, we're not spending it on other kinds of things. And so the, if you like, the peril of the phone that's always on in the hand is not that the phone is bad, or that the experiences you're having with and through that phone may not be in many ways rich and profound, is that if it's always on in the hand, you are being, by definition, 
denied other types and textures of attention that might otherwise have come. Your mind is perhaps not wandering in the, may, in the way it might have done while you're walking along. You are perhaps ignoring the person who is in the room with you, or you are ignoring the building in front of you, or you are ignoring what's going on in the street. And it's not that this is bad. It's that ultimately, I think, we can end up in exactly what you suggested, which is a situation where we are, all our attention becomes the same type. All our time becomes the same type of time because there is simply something we are always semi-attending to constantly there on a screen with us. And this then is worrying in what it means we're missing out on rather than because it's bad in and of itself. So again, I want to get away from the idea of technology is toxic or of manipulations as irresistible. So what can we do about this? You know, what, what does one say? Well, I think looking at boundaries is very important. Looking at different types and textures of attention time, as I said, different places, and the ways in which they might be valuable to you. Thinking about what deserves your attention in different senses of that word. Who deserves your undivided attention? I'm most acutely conscious of this because I have young children. And the kind of attention my children deserve from me as little human beings, that type of attention, they deserve unstinting attention from me. They deserve that unstinting attention partly because what my distracted attention conveys to them is that they matter about as much as the things on my screen or that the kind of attention that one gives to a person one loves and wishes to nurture is nevertheless never total. Mm -hmm. the, the kind of attention they can be expected to give to others is only ever partial. Once you have young children, I think you can look at your own habits with a somewhat fearful eye in terms of what you're establishing as a precedent, as a norm. And also in, in the very simple sense, when children are learning speech, ideas, empathy, values, the way you learn and relate to people is profoundly different depending upon the quality of attention you're paying them, the way you are and aren't alive to nuance, the respect that underlies that, the ability to have a silence together which isn't filled by the nervous tick of glancing at a screen. You know, those silences at the end of which someone breaks into tears or says, you know, I've been really worried about this. Mm -hmm. Or laughs. Or you both start laughing. Or you both notice something. I don't want to idealise this in the sense that this is good and technology is bad. I very specifically want to say that unless we are careful, we will end up without even noticing it, turning all our time into the same kind of time. And that is dangerous because it denies us this gamut of kinds of attention and interrelationship that we really need if we are to relate fully to others, if we are to communicate fully, if we're to work out, if you like, what we really think, what's really going on, if we're to take ownership of our thoughts and so on. And I end up feeling that in some ways, the idea of the kind of perfect manipulators, you know, social media, propagandists, and so on, is, is a very um, dangerous category error. These people are not perfect manipulators. They're not sort of masters of psychology who are puppet masters pulling, pulling the strings that you cannot resist. They're absolute masters at making you predictable when you're on the device. That's what's going on. So the manipulative behavioral engineering, if you like, it's a kind of self-fulfilling prophecy. It's specifically designed to elicit certain behaviors from people that can be packaged and sold to other people um, because when people are on device, they are predictable. It doesn't mean they're predictable in general. But it does mean that if you spend all your time on device, your behaviours will tend to be of this predictable type. 
what drives mm-hmm. dopamine for the person that's on this device, right? What is going to get them moving and get them focused on doing what I want them to do in some that's way, right. shape or form, right? Or what they think they want to do or their yeah. neurochemistry is telling them that they yeah. want to do. But that is not the full story. Right. That's not the full story of the person. It's not the full story of the mind. And I think I think this is the really pernicious category error. You know, the, the logic goes like, when a person is on device, a lot of the time they can be made to behave predictably in certain ways, which are to do with, yes, dopamine reuptake and, and various other social needs and anxieties and wants. Therefore, people are predictable and easily manipulable at all times. Therefore, this is a fundamental truth about human nature. Therefore, behavioral science is basically all we need and the rich interior life is an illusion. None of that follows. Mm-hmm. The moment you get off device, the moment you start to do other stuff, the moment you start to attend in different ways, you become a different you, potentially. And you need to be many different yous. You need to contain multitudes, not diminish those multitudes down to a kind of caricature. And the way to do that is to practice being, well, to draw upon an Aristotelian idea, to practice being those multiple yous. And the way to to, do that is to to, not have all of your time in this flattened sense of time, as it were, just to be spending all of it do by doing tech yeah. attention in that space. Otherwise, the habit will be being the singular you. That's right. That's right. Absolutely. And, you know, the Aristotelian observation, you are that which you most often do. Um, I think, you know, look at your practices, look at your habits, look at your places, look at communities, look at your people, look at the things you do, and realise that to be, quote, unquote, better or better at something is, is not to sit there saying, goodness me, I wish I wasn't on Twitter so much, is to go and do, do first, become yeah. gradually. We are always in the process of becoming. And this is why I greatly value the virtue ethical tradition in the context of technology, precisely because I think it's it's modest. It, it, it is not at all about the idea of conducting some kind of consequentialist calculus in advance. This is the optimal use of my time. You know, it's, I think optimizing is a very, um, very slippery slope, should we say, but nor is it about an imperative in the sense of saying, well, this is the best possible action that I should take. And if I only sit down and work it out, I mean, that's obviously a caricature of two different ethical schools, but I think the idea of role models of the capaciousness of virtue of the, the sort of path that can lead us in directions of of enrichment and growth without presupposing a final single destination um, or indeed a single pathway. I think all this can be very enabling because you can, on a practical level, you can say to people, look, you you are worried that you're not doing enough for others, that you're self-centered or cut off or alone. Go find some spaces to be with some other people. You know, you're worried that you're distracted. Go spend a bit more time with your kids, turn your phone off for a bit, switch it off and put it in a drawer and spend half an hour being silly in the garden you're worried that your thinking's you know going to pot you know read a book a physical book sit in a cafe with a book for half an hour or you're very you can't do any of this because your job is relentless well find some great music to listen to while you're while you're doing your job or look at a beautiful thing for two minutes or just you know open your eyes and draw a deep breath none of the perfect should never be the enemy of the good you know the good is an ongoing work in progress. So you, you've just hit on, I think, multiple really important points that all of which John and I would love to sort of double click on here. <laughs> um, you've already brought us down the road of relationships. I want to come back to that in just a second prior to going down that road. And if there's time, I think we'd love to talk about the, the topic of virtue as well. Um, you mentioned that not all time spent is the same sort of time, right? So how do we spend our time, the quality of that time? And I think you've laid out a really nice sort of spectrum. You know, you might include multitasking, which is really distracted um, or or quick switching, right? Behavior and attentional distribution. We know the brain doesn't really multitask complex activities really well. We can multitask habitual things, right? Then you've got single tasking, right? Deliberate focus, all the way to the flow state, which is, as far as I think we know, is really kind of one of the deepest forms of engagement. So I want to highlight that for our listeners, right? It's not just spending time, but how you spend time, right? Now, that there's a nice bridge there, obviously, with what we're talking about in terms of how we interact with technology. You mentioned boundaries, which is so important, and the way you put boundaries around your tech usage so that you spend time with your people in very intentional, deep, engaging ways. 
But there's another element to the relationship piece that I want to ask about, which is, is there a place for creating, fostering, maintaining, deepening relationships online, on devices? And what might that look like? Yeah, absolutely. And and I think the quality of experiences is in many ways a more meaningful thing to, to focus on than the mediation of those experiences. I, I think it's very important to sort of try to get rid of that very crude dichotomy between real life and on-screen life. I don't think that does us many favours. You know, the pandemic has taught us, I think, that through the screen of a an iPad or other tablet by Android, um, <laughs> you can have an intensely meaningful relationship, even though there will perhaps be something missing that you can you can communicate with loved ones in a way that is enormously life enhancing. You know, my goodness, the world would have been so much worse even than it was if we hadn't been able to just get on screen in our millions and see on a screen the people we love and care about at a time when we can't be there to touch them and hold them. With that said, I, I think it's really important to think about the the kind of time and the ways you can make a particular experience as good as possible a version of that experience. So it's possible to have a really terrible face-to-face interaction if you're, you know, yep. distracted, if you're inattentive, if you're indifferent, or if you're shy. I really wouldn't want to presuppose that an in-person interaction is just better. There was a lovely, very silly, viral example of a um, of a parish council meeting during the pandemic uh, when a woman called Jackie Weaver became briefly a social media hero for booting out of this virtual online meeting, um, as far as I could tell from watching, a couple of very obnoxiously loud men. Now, this was rather wonderful because if you're actually in a parish council meeting face to face, it is much harder for a diminutive female to boot or boot out of the meeting or silence a couple of obnoxious large men. Um, and this was an example, I think, of, of one very simple way in which a virtual version of something can arguably be, be more sure. egalitarian. In a funny way, if you're interested in getting past various kinds of bias and prejudice, you could make the case that interactions that are asynchronous, where I simply mean you're not all talking at the same time, you're all contributing to a forum or a thread, can be better quality or better at achieving certain results in terms of clarity of thought or inclusion than asking everybody to turn up at a particular point. And again, fairly obviously, a conference or event or meeting that's online is at least in principle far easier for people to attend regardless of their economic status than one which requires you to be able to fly out to California for a week and stay in a hotel there. So I think the moment we start getting into what are we trying to achieve, what does it feel like a good version of the experience look like, and how can we best use technology in the service of the good, we start to get into a more nuanced conversation. So in person, using technology in the service of the good might be you know, putting your phones away and switching off your devices, but exchanging documents or messages first or sharing things. And online, it may be that we can use meetings and forums and synchronous and asynchronous stuff to be really inclusive, to be really good at overturning certain biases and, and structural problems. I do think that the theme that runs through this is one of kind of honesty and specificity um, and of confessing our, our vulnerabilities and our longings and saying, well, you know, my my mum, who lives on her own, who I couldn't see during the early pandemic at all, would read the children, my children, bedtime stories via the iPad in the evenings. And that was beautiful and sustaining yeah. and not as good as her being there in person. Sure. But then in a way, in order for the good thing to happen, what we needed was a conversation about what we could do so far as possible to capture good things, but also to be honest about what we were missing and how we missed it and how then 
when we could do something else, we would do that and make that happen. And maybe it was more important to do certain things than certain other things. So maybe it was more important that she should see her, just, just see her grandchildren than that it should involve a big family dinner, for example, a very trivial example. The last thing I just throw in here is uh, an observation made by Oliver Berkman, um, who has written very brilliantly, I think, about modest ways of making your life better, a sort of anti-optimizing perspective. And he just points out that really in terms of good quality time, really you know, good quality personal connection or deep thinking, you can't do that stuff all the time. It's fine to multitask and be distracted. It's fine to, to, to fiddle around. Aim for one or two hours a day of really good quality something. And if you achieve that, pat yourself on the back. Cut yourself some slack. Don't, once again, make the perfect the enemy of the good. Don't punish yourself for any interaction or experience you, you deem to be subpar or low quality. Mm -hmm. Think about what it means to do it better next time. But also say, okay, if, I, if one or two really great hours of something in a day, that's a real achievement. If I can do that every day, I will be a happy person. Wonderful. Great. Love it. Yeah, great examples. And I mean, there's so many takeaways here, Tom. Thank you. So many you know, intellectual and practical takeaways from this um, that, that we've, we've benefited from. And I, and I sincerely hope all our listeners have benefited from. And that's why I think, you know, it's, it's going to be really interesting to hear what your answer to this next question is, because I, I can think of many possibilities uh, such as not letting the perfect become the enemy of the good or the idea of cultivating constructive, collaborative humility as an important virtue. Um, but perhaps you'll say something else altogether. I'm, I'm fascinated to hear what you might say here. So for our final question, we, we ask all our guests the flourishing question. What's the one lesson on flourishing you want our listeners to walk away with? And what might be a practical step for putting that lesson into action? I guess... One of the lessons is that there are as many versions of flourishing as there are people, and that what other people know and do and think is, is far stranger and richer and more surprising than we can easily imagine. And so in a practical sense, being able to say, as often as possible, I don't know, what do you think is just a great habit? Say it on social media, say it in person. Hmm. when you can. I don't know. What do you think? Hmm. Expose yourself as best you can to the vastness of the unknown. Love it. Perfect. Wow. Succinct, to the point, easy, tangible, doable. Terrific. Unlike all my other ones. <laughs> which no, are, which all of them have been long. wonderful, but uh, we, we always <laughs> love it when we ask the flourishing question when somebody can really drive the point home. And I think you you have tied together so much of what uh, you've said today and, and our listeners will really benefit from. So, Tom, we want to be respectful of your time. This has been incredible. Absolutely wonderful conversation. Really appreciate all of your insights, the nuances, the, the tangible takeaways um, that I know listeners will really appreciate as well. Thank you for the, the time and, and for your energy. Oh, it's my great pleasure. Thank you. Thank you so much. Um, and um, yeah, listeners can, if they want to stalk me online, they can they can find me on social media and ask me questions. And I'll, Please, I'll throw, try throw to all your handles. Yeah, we were just going to ask. <laughs> yeah, where can people find you? I mean, Twitter's a good one. I try to not be on there too much, but I also try, and fail, but I, I try to kind of reserve it for high quality interactions. So uh, it's it's a great place. I think, you know, using technology well, it's a great place for, for asking a kind of interesting question to people and, um, and trying to find out what other people think. I think if you can go into Twitter with a little bit of epistemic humility, um, it, it's incredibly rich. Mm -hmm. So I, I hang out there when I'm, when I'm hanging out online. <laughs> I, I try not to be in too many other places. <laughs> when you're cu cultivating that, that you, that version of Tom Chatfield. Yeah, that one. <laughs> so it's, um, it's your website is tomchatfield.net. That's correct. And yep. Twitter handle is just Tom Chatfield. That's right. Yeah. Yep. Yep. Fantastic. And your most recent book is How to Think. And we're looking forward to, to reading your many forthcoming books, particularly the one on the evolution of human beings with technology. That's um, when's that forthcoming, Tom? I think that will be not till next year. Okay. Um, I've got to finish writing it first. 
Um, okay. But yeah, it will be coming out, I think, in 2023 at some point. Fantastic. Well, thank you for joining us today. This has been a great conversation. Really enjoyed it. Thank you for tuning in to Flourish FM. And um, thank you, Tom. Have a wonderful, wonderful day. Take care, everyone. Thank you. Thank you so much. Huge thanks to all of you for listening to today's show. If you like what you heard, please share it with friends, family, colleagues, and be sure to leave us a five-star review. Uh, You can also find us on all social media platforms. Uh, We've got our own YouTube channel, and you can check out our website at flourishfmpodcast.com. We'd also love to hear from you. There's a survey in the show notes you can complete where you can complete any suggestions on guests you'd like to hear us interview or particular topics or themes you'd like to hear us talk about. We'd love to hear your feedback on that, so your feedback would be greatly appreciated if you could fill out that form. Until next time, thank you very much for joining us today. And keep putting in the work.